Welcome back, everyone. I would uh, now like to uh, introduce Professor Margaret Leahy from Dublin City University. We are very fortunate to have her here uh, from Dublin for, uh, for the keynote here. Uh, Professor Margaret Leahy uh, is also the member of staff in School of STEM Education. She is also leading the Innovative Study Program uh, in Ireland. Uh, she is also part of the IFIP uh, Program uh, Working Group 3. IFIP is the International Federation for Information Processing. And uh, also she is um, she's part of the development team of digital strategy in Ireland schools. So um, I take immense pleasure in inviting Margaret for a next uh, keynote. And very importantly, she has just last week visited IT in Assam schools. So we are very excited to hear from her about her experiences in Assam IT. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you very much, and can I start by saying it's my privilege and it's my honour to be here. In particular, um, as Amina said, I visited some of the schools, some of the VGMs, and some of, I think you call them diets, which is the equivalent of our Institute of Education in Assam. And while there, I spoke to the teachers and your students. I was blown away by the hospitality. Um, I've known Amina for quite a number of years now, so I have followed the development of the ITE project for many years. And each time I hear more, I see that the learning has got deeper and deeper. So in seeing some of the projects in Assam, I'm going, wow, this has really got deeper. Um, in particular, I was really impressed with your children. I call them all children. To me, they're all babies. The way they could interact with me, a stranger speaking a different language. Many of them didn't have English. The way they could describe their projects, the way they could articulate their learning and the importance of this work. I mean, that's huge. So from children from the age of 10 up to, I think about 16 I met. Oh, the mic, excuse me. Is that better? Okay. Um, to be able to do that, particularly these children from rural communities, I commend you all on that work, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So thank you. So in what I am going to talk about today, I hope I've met the brief. I've said this to uh, Amina already. I think in many ways it will be affirming for what you do. So as I talk, maybe you could be listening and say, hang on here, we did that. Or maybe you could think, oh, I do that, but by just doing this little bit more, it's going to make what I do even deeper, okay? So just to put everything into context, I'm from Ireland, which is 5,000 miles away from here. So I have an awful habit of turning. You'll see it, it's that tiny little green dot um, on the map. Um, we have a population of 4.8 million. Now, I know you'll all start laughing, in comparison to 1.3 billion um, people in, in India. We have about 20,000 Indians living in Ireland that have permanent residency. We have about 34,000 altogether. That's huge for us. Anytime I say it here, people laugh, but that's a significant minority in our country. Now, just a few fun facts before I start. We do have a shared history with India. We were both colonies of the UK, so there are similarities in our constitution and yours. There are connections around the evolution of the independence process and things like that. But that's all for another day. Did you know that we're among the biggest tea drinkers in the world? You might produce it, but we drink it. We have it with our breakfast, we have it with our dinner, we have it with our tea, and we have it at least on two more occasions during the day. So I suspect we're bigger tea drinkers than the Indians. I know nothing about cricket, but we do have an Irish cricketer who has the world record for the fastest century in a World Cup. Oh yeah, I hear you mentioning his name, okay. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the captain of the English cricket team is also from Dublin. No, bet you didn't know that. And, most importantly, our Prime Minister is half Indian. Um, his dad is a doctor from Mumbai. He went to the UK in the 1960s where he met an Irish nurse, 
married her, and came back and settled in Dublin. Leo is the product of that union. Um, he also trained as a medical doctor, but politics was his calling. So he became um, one of the youngest prime ministers in the world in 2017, when at the age of 38, he became prime minister um, of Ireland. And he, I'm a bit biased because I like his party, but uh, he's doing quite a good job, I think. Okay. Now, just to put everything in context, so that you can see where I'm coming from, or you can compare your own context, a very little bit about the Irish education system. Um, in particular, our school systems. It's divided into two, primary and post-primary. Primary goes from about four years up to 12 years, when post-primary is from 12 years up to 18. Compulsory schooling is up to the age of 15, but in the main, the vast majority do stay on until 18. We have two state exams, one taken at age 15, that's not that important, but at age 18, every student must take the Leaving Cert examination. Now that is, it's the same as India. It's a really important exam because a student's results in that examination determines what they can do at third level. So it's like you, the best students usually go on finance, law, medicine, teaching, which, which we're still a high stat, excuse me, teaching is still high status in Ireland, which is a good thing. But what that means and talking to you, I know you have similar concerns, is that it makes the upper end of school very rigid. So when I, and I work in digital learning, go to secondary schools to talk about projects or to try and involve teachers in projects, I get the same response all of the time. We have the Leaving Cert. We have a curriculum to cover. We have to get our children through this, our students through this curriculum because we are judged by the grades that our students get. I'd love to do your technology lark, but I haven't time. So we face that challenge as well. Okay, so that's just the background. So what we need to think of, and all over the world, we are facing the same questions, the same challenges, the same hurdles, and so on. Maybe in different ways, but they are the same. So we are driven by this major challenge, is how do we best prepare these young people that are in our care to thrive in this 21st century. Now, why do things need to change? I always think it's interesting to go back and look at that kind of thing. But if you look at this graph here, I think you can see it. And you go back and you look at the 1960s, 1970s, you will see that the demand for skills focuses on routine manual and non-routine manual work. So that's what we were producing our students for. But in the last two decades or, so, decades or so, that has changed. What employers are now demanding are the non-routine analytical, the non-routine interactive skills. They want critical thinkers. They want team players. They want people who can communicate. And even last year, um, this is a report I found that came out from Australia. And it reckoned by 2030, that workers will spend 30% more time learning on the job, 100% more time using science and math skills, and 41% more time on critical thinking and judgment. So that's our context. Now, I'm not going to go on about 21st century skills because I know many of you have studied these as part of your certificate course, and this is what you're trying to embed in the teaching and learning in your areas. But just look at those skills for a minute. They mirror what we said on the previous slides. We see our collaboration, our citizenship, our critical thinking, and so on. So, when we consider future-focused learning, we are talking about doing and making. Applying knowledge and skills to solve real problems, not just theoretically, but practically. Now let's take another step back before we move on. Because again, it's very easy to get caught up in what we're doing ourselves. And it's very easy, and we do this as Irish people too, to think, oh, they're wonderful in Singapore, or they're wonderful in Finland, or you know, we're, we're way behind. But just let's look at the patterns that currently exist globally. Um, 
For the most part, where technology is used in schools, in teaching and learning, it's used by the teacher. It's mainly in the hands of the teacher. It's used as a presentation tool. Yes, I've got media-rich resources. I can show wonderful YouTube videos. I can have my PowerPoints, but I'm still using it to instruct or to present information to students. It is known that it's rare. It doesn't happen too often that the technology is in the hands of the students. And where it is, it's generally for low-level activities, such as curriculum enforcement. By that I mean maybe practicing skills in maths or literacy. Maybe they're engaging in some video-based tutorials. They might be doing a little bit of research, but all they're doing is just looking up some websites and taking some facts. Like Amina was saying earlier, oftentimes it's in computer labs that are away from the classroom. By having these computers away from the classroom, we have the, the tension between, oh, is it a tool as part of our curriculum? Can we embed it in our curriculum? Or is it divorced from what we're doing in the classroom? So there are patterns that are emerging across the world. Um, and also that there are ver there's very little that promotes higher order thinking skills. Even in cases where um, students are using things like Excel, spreadsheets, or they're building databases, they tend to do it for very low level activities. They're collecting the data and they might be showing a graph, but they're not doing any of the higher analytical stuff such as what if modeling um, and, and so on, okay? So you're not alone, we're not alone, they're the patterns. In fact, sorry, I have one more thing to say about that. There, there was a study done just last year in the US, it was called the Ranch Survey, and it showed that 60% of teachers in the US are using technology in a very passive way. Now, of course, that's not to say that there's not pockets of innovation, or there's not countries where there is innovative practice. Of course there are. But the point is, and I'm repeating myself, is that we're all grappling with the same things. How do we get technology from being used passively to put it in the hands of our students where they become learners as producers or, or creators. I think this framework is very useful. Um, there are many frameworks out there, but this is one that we use all of the time. And the reason that we use it is that it allows us to position ourselves where we're at at any given point in time with regards to the use of technology in teaching and learning. Now, uh, we just call it the framework at this point. But as you can see, it actually divides the system into sections. You've got understanding ICT and education, curriculum and assessment, pedagogy, organization and administration, and so on. And within each of those areas, you can see where are we at in relation to how we use technology. And they see it in three ways. There's technology literacy, technology deepening, and technology creation. Putting that on a table, by technology literacy, I'm basically just talking about the development of technological skills, just like we spoke about that's happening in schools around the world. Moving along the continuum, we move from knowledge deepening, which is where you use knowledge to add value to society and the economy by applying it to solve complex real-world problems, and then on to knowledge creation, where our students become innovators and producers of new knowledge. Okay? So what I thought would be useful, um, you can tell me afterwards whether it was or it wasn't, was kind of to look at how do I move along that trajectory? And as I say, as you're looking at it, you can say, oh, that's what we're doing. Oh, we've moved from here to here. And I took examples of digital story stroke PowerPoints because I think they're very useful. Now, the first one I have here was done by a 12-year-old boy. Um, it's not cricket, it's soccer. So he was asked to do a project in school, and this is what he came up with. Now, without even reading it, you can see, yeah, he went on the internet, he did a little bit of research, but it was really only a regurgitation of facts. It could even be copy and paste. He may not have put it um, into, his own world, into his own words. So all we can say about this was the PowerPoint was not really used in his learning. Instead, what he's learned here is his technical skills, how to use PowerPoint. So that would be at the techno technology stage. And as Amina was saying earlier, generally when we start these types of projects, that's what you see first. 
students get excited, they love it, they love bells and whistles. And if I played this for you, you'd have all sorts of songs and things flying across the screen because that's what students, or I think even anybody does, when they're introduced to this at the first stage. But our question is, how do we move from that to do something more deeper? Sorry, don't need that. So I decided I would take a project that I worked on a few years ago. Now, it was a local history project. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how is that meaningful? But this particular project was in a school, an inner city school in Dublin. So it would be a socially disadvantaged school. Now, poverty in Ireland is slightly different. Well, it's not different. But if you fall into a certain category, you do get government in, uh, intervention in terms of finance. However, the particular area in which these children lived, um, you'd have alcohol abuse, drug abuse, probably single parent families. Generally, the granny would be bringing up the children. Maybe some of the parents were in jail for crime. That, that's the area. Um, you'd have low literacy skills, and generally you would have students that are disinterested in school. So we had this teacher, and she was saying, I need, I just, I need to get them going. If I can find something that they're interested in, then I have them. And for some reason, these boys were very interested in history. Where they lived was a very historic area. And she said, they are really interested in history. So maybe if I got them to make their own local history um, artifact, which would be used as maybe somebody is coming to Dublin and you've got to bring them on a tour of our area. What would you do? So that was the basic question. So essentially, it was a narrated slideshow. Again, old school, poor school. The equipment in the, or the infrastructure in the school wasn't great. The computers there wouldn't even support photo story, so she used a narrated PowerPoint. There's always ways um, around things. Um, so what the boys had to do was that in groups of three, they had to create this narrated slideshow. So when the teacher started to talk to them about their local area, she quickly discovered they knew nothing. Despite being interested in history, she started off with a simple question. If somebody came in here today, what would you tell them they should go and see in our area? She got things like the sweet shop, the pub, the playground. Nobody mentioned, you know, the historical churches or the historical artifacts that were on their doorstep. So what she did was she brought them on a walking tour of the area. They took photographs of areas of interest. That was one part. When they came back, they researched these on the web. Now, a lot of the websites that they found were beyond their reading level. They couldn't read them. But they were so interested in this project that they stuck with it and managed to read it. Now, you know with PowerPoint, if I want to put something coherent together, it can be difficult because really it's just a series of facts. So that's why she went with the narration. We're going to narrate each slide. That brought up another problem. Now we need to do a script. So what she found, or what her struggle was, she had to get these children and teach them how to synthesize the information across these websites. That's a higher level reading skill. And that took a long time to do, but because the boys were so motivated and so interested in this authentic task, they stuck with it. In tandem, they went and they interviewed, you've, you've done this, interviewed people in the area. They interviewed the market holders, the butchers. Um, and in doing that, they learned, well, how do I draft an interview schedule? What are the questions I need to ask? They went out with their recorders, they recorded it. And again, they had to synthesize that information. And they had to use all of that information to tell their story um, um, about their areas. There's just an example of, of the script. There's some photos of the boys going around the area, taking their photographs, talking to a local shopkeeper, and here they are making their, their projects. Now, this took 12 weeks. So again, it feeds back to what you're saying. As you get deeper or into more meaningful learning, it does take longer, okay? So this is the kind of thing they came up with. Now, of course, if you were looking at these PowerPoints, you wouldn't see that writing. So you'd be looking at the picture, you press the button, and you'd listen to what they had to say. And at the very end of it, the parents were invited in, and some of them were displayed in front of the parents. Now, for these disaffected boys, they were coming in saying, this was wonderful, I can't wait to show my nanny, I can't wait to show my mother. And the teacher said to me, every day they're coming in telling me something about the area. 
So it really drew them in. So that's a simple project. Now, I hope that was resonating with you because as I was talking to many teachers and I saw projects um, over the last few days, that's the kind of thing I saw in Assam or in talking to the children last night. Here were some projects that I saw, the pottery project, the flooding project, the microbiology project, the farming project. In a sense, they all followed the same pattern. They went out into the community, they spoke to people, they identified problems in the community, they came back, they did their research, and they crafted their research um, in the form of a PowerPoint. Okay, so you can see that they have research, analysis, synthesis, application to real life, and they're making sense of the world through critical learning and reflection. And I just put that in yesterday, the bottom quote there. This is a little girl that I was talking to in Assam. Now, she didn't have much English, but she was so excited and she was so enthusiastic telling us what she had learned about microbiology. So Durba, you remember this? Durba was sitting here, I was here, and the child was here. So she'd start off in English and she'd get stuck. And she'd animatedly explain to Durba what she was trying to say. They'd have a conversation. I couldn't pick up much in it. Durba would translate and Anna would go. Now, isn't that awesome? Well, I thought it was anyway. Oh, sorry. So what she said was, we need to know this so we can know how to prevent disease. In ICT project, we can get more information from the internet than we can get from books. What she said was they had the textbook, but she got more from the internet and she synthesized the two to put this into her PowerPoint. Then we put all of this information in PowerPoint. It helps us to learn more and learn better. And she also said it was fun. Okay, just listing the learning that was observed in all of those, in all of those projects. Okay, you can read those for yourselves. By soft skills, what I mean is the ability to interact with people who come into your environment, to stand up and to express and tell about your project to someone. That's huge. I was talking to a lady um, while we were having the tea, and she was saying even four years ago, the children in her project would not have been able to do that. They were too shy. But as they have got used to doing these projects and talking to people, now they will stand up and they'll talk to ministers. They'll talk to Amina. They'll talk to anybody who will listen to them about their projects. So if we go back to this UNESCO framework, you will see that we have moved right into the knowledge deepening um, section. Okay. Um, sorry, excuse me. I just lost my train of thought. I shouldn't do that. But we, we are beginning now to move along the trajectory. How then can I straddle between knowledge deepening and knowledge creation? To me, it's about doing that work, but actually implementing your findings, doing something with those findings, whether it's an innovation, whether it's an idea, whether it's a project in the community, something like that. So again, I took one project. This is from Ireland, and it's from a rural school, or two rural schools in the west of Ireland. Now, in the west of Ireland, a lot of our primary schools are two teachers. So that means children from 4 to 12 are in the same school, but they will only have two teachers over the duration of that period before they move on to secondary school. So it can be quite isolating. But this particular teacher, she, um, her problem was, I have these four and five-year-olds. I need reading material for them. We have some. I'm running out. I need more. I need to stretch them. I need something that grabs their interest. So what she did is she presented this idea to grade eight, nine year old, uh, grade eight or grade nine, it would be in India. And she asked them, will you create an ebook for the children in my class? So these were the conditions. The ebook had to be tailored to the interests of the Pacific children. So the older children were paired up and they worked with one younger child. It, the book had to be written in a genre that reflected the interest of the child. It had to contain at least 10 words that were new to the child and 10 words that needed to be revised. So the word lists were supplied by the teacher itself, herself. And at the end, each junior child would have a personalized book 
that met their specific needs and interests. Okay, it sounds, it's awful simple. But if you think of the learning that goes into this, the older children, they had to speak to the learning support teacher or a teacher that specialised in reading because they had to learn all about this process of reading, receptive language, expressive language, how, how do the two work together? They also had to learn what kind of vocabulary should four and five year olds be learning? Where are, where are they on this? What do I need to put in here? Now the teacher was also very clear, she says we need to assess this. So they had to devise their own rubric that would monitor or assess their progress as they made this book and also that they would use as a class to assess the projects at the end. To do that, uh, the teacher supplied them with a set of rubrics and they had to devise their own rubric from those. They then went and met with the younger children, they had their discussion, they did their mind mapping, they went off and they wrote, wrote the book and then they had to narrate it. Okay, sorry. Oh, am I pressing? My apologies. Uh, what they used to create this book was an application called Checkup App. It's free. Everything we use is free. Um, and the import... I keep doing this, losing my train of thought. Sorry, I'm not used to speaking so slow and my brain work, it goes miles ahead of me. So they made the book, so they had to write their stories, they had to input the pictures, and then they had to narrate it. So the importance of using relevant pictures to support and enhance the text in each page was emphasized, as was the importance of using, and I could learn from this myself right now, appropriate pace, pitch, and tone when audio recording the story. Okay, so that's the Chekhov app. And I just took some screen grabs of the stories just to show you. At the end of the process, the teacher uploaded them to this website called Fit for Life, where you can get books like this. And she has since, this was done two years ago, she has used those books over the past two years with her junior children. And they love them because they're tailored to their specific needs and interests. So they're very simple. Um, here's a story about a rainy day. As you can see, the image here was done electronically. Typed in this, and if I press this, I should hear my story. It was working this morning. It's not now, okay. And this, I also put, took some screenshots of this one because I really like it. These children worked with the younger child and the younger child drew the pictures. So this is a story about a baby lamb being born. We have lots of sheep in Ireland. And if you're very lucky, when your family has a new baby lamb, your dad might give it to you and you can raise it, sell it at the mart and then you have some money. So that's what this story was all about, okay? Right, that's one example. But can you see how it is just taking what you do in terms of the, of the research, the analysis, putting it together, I'm taking the next step forward in that I'm actually creating something that is of use to somebody else. The second example, I'll go through it very quickly, is it concerns robotics. We have um, a robotics lab in our university. We call it the Lego Studio. There it is. As you can see, it's just a blank room, but it's colourful. And the reason that we keep it with very little furniture is that we see it as a flexible learning design where we can just pull um, tables and chairs as we need them. Now, the kind of things we do in it is we use um, Lego Robotics a lot. Have you heard of Lego Robotics? So, uh, it's just like Lego, but you can add sensors to it, such as touch, motion and so on, and you program it through the computer that it will do something. We also use EV3, which is kind of an upgrade on the Lego, and we use that with the, with the older children. We also use the Arduino that I saw some children using last night. Now, this was a project that we did last year. We did this project with groups from 10 years old, from 7 to 10 years old, right up to 16-year-olds, and we gave them the exact same brief. We did it in out-of-school clubs, and we did it in school club. We called it the Aqua Project. And this was their brief. Research a problem related to water sustainability and develop an innovative local solution. Using the Lego We Do materials um, and a range of other materials, 
design, build and programme an autonomous motorised model and design and create a poster presenting some aspect of the research. So it wasn't just that they designed a model. That model had to be designed within the context of a solution to a problem in relation to water that they had identified, but they also had to present their research and how they came up with their solution as part of the project. Okay? Now, again, it was already said this morning, when you do these things, you have to carry out research because you have to know what works, why it works, how it works, if we'll continue it for the future and what the value of it is. So we did that with the younger children. And what we discovered at the end, end of it, through engaging in this project work, um, they did develop disciplinary knowledge in science. You can read it there. They did develop disciplinary knowledge in technology and engineering. And their problem-solving skills did develop. Now, what kind of solutions did they come up with? Now, we have the opposite problem in Ireland than you have here. Where I live in Ireland, it rains every single day. So we have sometimes problems with flooding, but also um, they're now going to charge us for water. So usage of water is an issue. So how do we go about the conservation of water? So conservation of water was the main, something around that was the main topic that all our groups took. So they did things like, even the very young children, they went home and they surveyed water usage, water wastage, basically. They did the same in schools, they did it in the communities. And they came up with ways that, well, what kind of a campaign can we run in our school? What kind of measures can we put in our home that we will actually conserve water? So there were very simple solutions, like one seven-year-old had some sort of a bell outside the shower and nobody was allowed to stay in the shower for five minutes. And when I met her dad, he told, them, told me that she had the house terrorised around uh, water wastage. And then at the other end of the scheme, now, I took some photos off the web just to show you what this was like. A group of 16-year-old boys really got into water harvesting and harvesting of rainwater. So what they came up with, and we have these, is attaching a barrel to the gutters and the chutes in your house. Now, if you don't know what the gutters and chutes are, if you look at the house in the middle, you'll see them going along the roof and the pipe going down along. That's to catch rainwater so that it will drain away from the house. So they attached this barrel to a pipe, so they had to drill a hole in the pipe, attach the barrel, and then there was another sort of contraption coming out of the barrel, and they used it to water the garden during the summer, okay? Or um, another guy, and he told me that his eight-year-old granddad actually did implement this. He hooked it up to the toilet system so that the rainwater was actually used to flush the toilet, okay? So there are pretty innovative solutions um, from young people. And in terms of the Lego, what they had to do was to design a robot to show this working in action. Now again, we do lots of projects like that, which involve the research, the analysis, the synthesis. But it's the end part that we see that's important, as in, what are you going to do with this? What is your implementation plan? So in the main, we see a lot around climate change, fair trade, uh, child labour. So in terms of of climate change, the typical project we would see, they would go off, they would investigate what is climate, what is climate change, what are the effects of climate change, calculate your carbon footprint. So bring that then from the global down to the local. So usually we see things in terms of paper, conservation, litter, water, energy. So the students will then go off and carry out surveys, carry out research, devise their own plans as to how we can implement solutions. Usually, it's in the home or the school. Okay? Now, I've seen some projects like that um, when I was in Assam, and again, talking to people today. Um, now, I probably have the detail of this incorrect, but somebody was telling me about a vaccinations project. And if you want to interrupt and say you've got it wrong, please do. But these young people, we're investing in vaccinations. What are vaccinations? Why do we need them? What vaccinations do we need? They put together an information pack or an information presentation. They invited the parents from their community to come and see this. 
The parents were then galvanized into action and they went and did something about it. Have I got that correct? He's nodding. Whew. That's good. And I'll just one final one, because this was a shared project. I'm very bad with names, but I was talking to a lady when we were having the tea. And she showed me a project that she had done with her children. And she showed me an area that was outside their school. And she was saying, this is where they play. So their challenge was to go and see how we can make this a play area. What do we have to do with it? And I said, can you believe that one of my students two years ago did the exact same project in Dublin? So in Dublin, the project was the, the students said to the teacher, we've nothing to do in the playground. We've nothing to play with. So she said, off you go. You go and do your research. You go and tell me what games you can play in that research. And then I want you to cost it and develop a budget that we can present to the principal to see, will he do this? So they surveyed, they spoke to grannies, they spoke to grandas, they spoke to parents. They collectively agreed with what they wanted to put in their playground. Then they went off and costed all of this. Um, they devised their budget and they made a presentation to the principal and the board of management who kind of said, oh, you can't have that much money. I'm only going to give you X. Off you go and fix your budget. There's your business model. With the result that there is now a play area in that school which was devised and costed by the children. Okay. So go back to this. What's different about the learning that was observed in those projects than in the earlier ones? Now we've brought in real world learning experiences even more, but it's the second one here. It's problem solving, student generated ideas and solutions. The students as the producers, the students creating the artifacts. Okay. And just to complete that, all of these projects, they involve problem solving and an experimentation. They draw on the curiosity and observations of learners, and they allow them to make sense of the world through critical thinking, making, and reflection. Now, if you think that's anything new, it's not. Because if you go back and you look at the learning theorists like Piaget and Papert, they say things like, we have to make inventors innovators, not conformists. Papert says the, the ability to physically make, test, analyze, rethink, remake, and retest as often as is needed allows for deep learning on the student's terms. And one last point in relation to that, every year, different organizations come out with what's going to be happening in learning, education, or in technology in the next year. What are the important things going to be? Learner as creator is listed at the top of this year's list, which came out. And it says, learners as creators, in which they embrace real world learning experiences that promote student generated ideas and solutions. Okay? So I hope I haven't bored you with that. Um, but I just, for me, when I was doing it, I thought it was very interesting just to track along the continuum. I also think for you, it should affirm a lot of what you're doing to see how far along that continuum that you are, but also to motivate you and, and hopefully inspire you to say, hang on here, if we just did this, then our learning is becoming even more meaningful. Now, before I finish, just let's have a little think about the role of the teacher. Never, ever, ever, I think, was the role of the teacher more critical or more important than we're doing um, these kind of projects. Now, I know I'm speaking to the converted here because you've all done this uh, certificate course, and you know that when teachers are driven by understandings of 21st century learning, and they need to understand these, then they can support an inquiry process. Then can they pose problems in which students can be involved, not just asked to solve. And they take on a more facilitative role. As you all know, there is a skill when, I, when you see a, ch a child working to say, OK, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? What are you doing next? Did you consider? There are times to question. There are times to stand back. There are times to intervene. That's hugely skillful. 
Um, but that's the kind of teacher role that is demanded in these projects. And if you're wondering about um, teacher professional development, it is cited everywhere as critical towards building the gap between technology and pedagogy. No technology will have the desired impact without professional development for teachers, because it's not simply enough to learn how to, but also to focus on why we should be doing this. And here's the thing, I feel quite strongly about this. It's not just the teachers who need the professional development, but also the school leaders. Because to me, the school leaders, and by that, I mean government, I mean your principals, I mean your local district authorities, or whatever you call them here, they need to understand this kind of work. They need to know its benefits so that they can promote it and encourage it um, in their schools. And this is something that is cited and, and argued by the OECD. They said professional development should target overall school culture, providing time for professional practice, collaboration, and identification of what works. Okay? So the, the message there is, is that anything that happens in a school is driven by a teacher's understandings of teaching and learning. And teachers need to understand what learning in the 21st century means in order that they can, I hate the word produce, or create learners as producers. Okay? Am I out of time? I can stop there, or it's just when Amina was talking, I thought maybe it would be useful just to share in three minutes with you what we've done in Ireland. Would that be of, of any use? Two minutes. I'll do it in two minutes. Okay. I can talk very fast, can I? Right. This is the real Margaret now. Um, just when Amina was talking earlier about the need for system change and where you go from, from now on with ITE, we're faced with the same problems. And all of the problems that you have listed, we're faced with. All of the hurdles that you have listed, we are also faced. But we have started to tackle this. I know our system is much smaller than yours, but we, had, we have started to tackle this at system level for the past five years. Reason being, if you saw what was happening in Ireland at the start of the century, you go, wow, they're on the crest of a wave. There was investment, there was infrastructure, and then it all stopped, nothing. We went into serious recession, no money. But in 2014, at last they decided, hang on, we've got to do something about this. So what did we do? We said, there's no point in just introducing an ICT initiative. It has to be part of the wider education system. So we set out with a vision. Because if you don't have a vision, where do you go? And if you have a vision, you must have a plan. So how did we come up with the plan? We started, we had carried out a census of what was happening in the school. As part of that census, it was underpinned by a literature review, exactly as our government minister said early, what's happening elsewhere? What do we know about these different areas of technology? We spoke to all the various stakeholders. And myself and my colleague, we wrote a consultative paper in which we posed a series of what we hoped were very thought-provoking questions as to what should be in this strategy. So with the result, in 2015, this digital strategy for schools was planned. This was followed by an action plan and followed last year by a framework. Now, the three are very much connected. And the framework, our schools, they have to undergo something which is called self-evaluation. So as a staff, we have to sit down and assess where we're at and where we're going to go. So our framework is tied very much into that. So it's like your rubrics. It has a series of steps. So the teachers in a school have to look at this, and they may decide we're just going to focus on one part of it for this year, but this is what we're going to do. And they have to come back at the end of the year and assess that. And then they have to decide what are we going to do for next year. That's the way we're working. Now, I can only say anecdotally, because I work with, a lot with student teachers, is that is beginning to cause a shift on the ground. In, traditionally, after placement, I would always say to a student, what did you see in the schools? What technology did you see your teachers using? And I got, oh, smart board, PowerPoint. 
But now I'm beginning to hear, oh, the children were doing Excel. The children had B-bots. So there is a shift beginning to happen. So we're finding, and hopefully, fingers crossed, money is being invested, invested in it by the state, and hopefully they will continue to do that, that that is actually beginning to work in Ireland. So look, thank you for listening to me. I hope it was in some way useful. As I say, um, it was my privilege to see the wonderful work that is going on through this project. I hope it goes on for a long, long time, and I wish you the very best with it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Margaret Leahy, for your insightful uh, speech, keynote. And uh, it was really enriching to hear your experience on field and uh, when you went to Assam, how you interacted with the students and how you explained through the continuum in your presentation. Anyway, we'll uh, just uh, request, uh, we'll just take two, three questions from the audience for uh, Professor Margaret Leahy. So if anybody wants to ask her any question, please. What is the kind of professional development at the pre-service level that you have which uh, prepares teachers with a perspective around digital learning? We call it digital learning. Digital lear learning is part of initial teacher education. So in our university, Students taking a B.Ed., it is compulsory that they must actually take courses in digital learning. And our thrust in that is that it's not skill-based, it's not an add-on, but that we must embed it in teaching and learning. Will I tell you our issue? That's what we do. Now, there is a need for what we do because we have to introduce things like the Lego or we have a new Minecraft room and we talk about that. But what we find is and we're continually pushing for this, is that our colleagues in other curriculum areas, so for example, if you're in literacy or curriculum geography or, or whatever, you must model how technology is used in your subject. It has to come both ways. So, as par and third point, and then I'll stop, as part of our new strategy, this was schools, but the next arm of it is, there's no point in just having it in schools, if we don't involve all the stakeholders. So the colleges of education and initial teacher education must be part of this as well. So the next step in this is that the colleges of education are going to have to put forward their plan as to how they're embedding technology in what they do um, in teaching and learning as part of initial teacher education. It's my passion, you can tell. So what is the digital infrastructure you have in your schools? I'm telling you, you'd probably be surprised if you saw it. It varies hugely. Um, there are some schools where it will be one-to-one. -one. Very few schools. In most schools, there would probably be a smart board and maybe a collection of laptops or tablets. Sometimes, in the lucky schools, there will be a case of tablets or laptops for the class, but in most cases, that trolley will be shared um, across the school. Now, our schools are small. At the, other continuum, at the other end of the continuum, we will have schools which will just have a smart board in a classroom and nothing else. So we have the continuum. There's been no state funding until the last three years in Irish education for technology. So schools were dependent on parents to raise money, charitable organisations and so on to fund um, technology in the schools. Because we were in deep recession, there was no money. <laughs> so we're not too different, really. See, but when you see your, actually your vision and your energy in terms of creation of a programme, a framework is very good but you don't have this sort of uh, infrastructure, it is really a negating, no? It, is it can be. Uh, discouraging also. You cannot yes. go forward, so that is the important thing. I, I can only answer from my context, okay? But I really believe that you work with what you've got. Like, you take that teacher in the first example there with the boys doing the history project. 
They were old computers. We tried everything to get, to get PhotoStory working on those. But we came up with a solution. Now, like ye, I have seen in Assam where teachers brought their own laptops. I've, th I've seen where students have brought their own laptops. So we're working around that. Yes, of course. Uh, teachers will always complain about infrastructure. They will always look for more. But I would equally argue, particularly in Ireland, that there are some schools that they could be doing more with the infrastructure um, that they have. And can I make the point about smartphones? This is my hobby horse, right? I am going on a rent. But um, most students have smartphones. Most houses have old smartphones at home. They're devices. Why can we not use those in schools? Now, okay, I see some of you laughing. We have the parental, you know, protestations. My belief is the tool of our society. We do need to teach children how to use it morally, ethically, for teaching and learning. Um, so even in Assam, when I was there the other day, and you kind of think, oh, you know, maybe they could do with a better infrastructure. I think about seven children took their smartphone out of their pockets and asked me for a selfie. So I'm thinking, if they have these smartphones, why can't they be used as part of their project work? If you don't want them to use the phone, take the SIM cards out. Get old ones without the SIM cards. And then you've got a camera, you can download the apps that you want, and you can use those. Sorry, but... That's just the way I feel about that. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. It, it's it's just no, it's not really a question. It's just wanting to know what whether you use that. What is it called? Gooseberry pie. <laughs> the small uh, sort of. Uh, the micro bits, is it? Yeah. Yes, we have micro bits. In all the schools. No, crikey's no. Um, we have them in the college. They're, they're new. They're, they're really only available on the market in the last year. So some schools have bought them, but not too many. But they are something that is becoming popular. So ask me next year and I'll be we should have a better idea of how many schools um, have them. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to know what is, uh, I don't know about the model of schools in Ireland, but in the Indian context, there are two kinds of schools that we see. One is a private system and then the government system. So there's, there's a lot of difference in the way technology is being used in the private schools and the government schools. So you talked about rural schools where learners are seen as producers. So are there any instances from some other private school models in your country? And another thing, what is uh, the kind of uh, industry school tie up in your country? Since in the Indian context, we see all kind of uh, tech startups coming up, and the kind of linkages they have with school, with schools is very different from the kind of model that you presented because uh, there is no connection between what happens inside yeah. the classroom and the startup which kind of comes in the school. Okay. Any insights on that? We are very lucky in that our school system is mainly state-based. At primary level, there are very few private schools. At secondary school, a very, very small percentage. So um, I wouldn't think there's a huge difference between those private schools and we'll say the good, by good I mean where the infrastructure is good in the state schools. Um, in terms of the public-private partnership that can exist between some schools and some companies, we have some of the large multinationals in Ireland Yes, they have designed school projects. For the most part, and for those that I have been involved with, they tend to involve the teacher educators or consultants, and a project is designed. Now, okay, we might be using their products, but we are looking at the pedagogy that, that we're, we're promoting or how they're being used in schools. So, Really, I don't think it is happening where the startup, we don't have that many startups, or if they have, they're so busy trying to make their own money that they have none to give away to anybody else. But I don't think that they're actually pushing their agenda um, on schools. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we'll stop the questions here. Uh, Margaret is here for both the days, and you can interact with her whenever we have time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Margaret Leahy.